Let's give the youth band a good hand clap. Thank you. Thank you for ministering. Let's stand together again. Well, last Sunday morning, I introduced you the, the theme or a sermon series that I'm going to be speaking to up to uh, the Sunday before Easter Sunday, and I entitled it The Sunrise Trail, S-U-N-R-I-S-E. Sunrise Trail, there is such a thing in good old Nova Scotia. And after I shared a description of the Sunrise Trail, S-U-N-R-I-S-E, someone said, you know, I just love to visit the Sunrise Trail. And I said, make sure you bring some money. Because they love your money down there. Tourism is very, very big, big in uh, Nova Scotia. And one of the things you can do, which I said was my favorite, was you can throw all your troubles in the Atlantic Ocean and just let it wash out to sea. And it's gone. This morning, what if I was to ask you if you'd like to travel the S-O-N Rise Trail? Not found in Nova Scotia, but in Jerusalem. The Sunrise Trail. And so we began, embarked on that journey last Sunday morning. And what if we embarked upon that journey as Jesus invited us to travel with him the last 24 hours of his life as he journeyed to the cross? If, if we were invited to travel with Jesus on that journey, and then stop for teaching points along the way, what would happen to you and I? I said to you last Sunday, here's what happened to you and I during this season of Lent. Flesh would bow to spirit. That's our desire during this season of Lent. We want to fully surrender ourselves to the Lord. And if we will travel with Jesus on this sunrise trail and stop and learn and hear what he's saying along the way, flesh will bow to spirit and we will be forever transformed and changed. So there were three things that kind of summarize what I said last Sunday morning, humility. Secondly was love. Thirdly was servanthood, humility. Humility is a big one, isn't it? Be it. And then there was love, show it. Servanthood, just do it. This morning I want to take you to the book of Mark, chapter 14. You, know, you won't be standing for long, but just for a little bit longer. Mark chapter 14, and we're going to read verse four, uh, 43 to 52. Mark chapter 14, reading verses 43 to 52. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion? Asked or said Jesus, that you would come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. You know, I was tempted to stop there, but, you know, there's these little nuggets, these little scriptures that cause me to scratch my head. The next one is this one. The next one is this one. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. It just makes me say, Wow. It gives me a picture, doesn't it? So, so it gave me another picture. Here's a follower. Now, he could have been a follower of Jesus. He ran. They grabbed him, tried to seize him. 
and he ripped out of his clothes and fled. But Jesus stayed and was led away. This man ran away, ran away with nothing on but a smile. Thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord, your word would speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you can take your seats. Growing up in good old Nova Scotia, Truro, Nova Scotia, to be exact, many of the roads down east, in my neck of the woods, are very windy, they're very hilly, and they're twisty. And many people that go visiting there have said, Gary, I, I get nauseous just traveling the roads in Nova Scotia. It's a dizzying, dizzying trail. Many of the roads, ah, I've said it before, what they do down east is they build a house and then put a road around it. That's what they do in the east. So they're windy, twisty, and hilly, narrow, nauseous. But as we chart the trail of Jesus as he nears his death, we can't help but notice that it was a winding, it was a dizzying, it was a maze-like, confusing, and difficult trail. So quickly... The trail of triumph, we, we, we know, we've read it before, on Palm Sunday, this trail of triumph on Palm Sunday was quickly turned to a trail of trauma for Jesus. It really was. As we just read, Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of betrayal. If you camp on there for a minute, consider the pain of that. Judas... A disciple, Judas, a friend. Judas, one that Jesus loved, a companion in ministry, betrays him. Kiss of betrayal. Consider the pain. Then the soldiers not only arrest Jesus and, and seize him, but they drag him this way and that way. They, they blindfold him and begin to punch him and then demand, okay, Jesus, prophesy. You're blindfolded. We're punching you. Now prophesy. Tell us which one of us are punching you. Quite a trail that Jesus was on. And then Judas, of course, hangs himself. They drag Jesus to both Religious and civil leaders in an attempt to build a case against him. They couldn't find any evidence, so they, they drum up what's needed. They have false witnesses coming forward. They have illegal trials taking place. At this time, then Peter is disowning Jesus. Jesus is bound and passes from one court to another, passes from one trial to another, from one site to another. The chief priests and elders persuade the crowd to call for Barabbas and to be released so Jesus then let him be crucified. Pilate has his hands in the air. I don't know what to do. It was dizzying. It was quite a trail that Jesus walked being yanked this way and that way and all these things taking place in his life. It was a dizzying, dark, disgraceful trail. For Jesus, and really, the legal system failed Jesus. It really did. Filled with falsehoods and floggings. Does anyone here really know what it's like to be on a winding, gruesome, difficult trail? Of course you do. Many hands will be raised. You know what difficult? Now, they could never be compared to Jesus' trail. I'm not even trying to compare your life with his. But we do know what it's like to be on dizzying, terrible, terrible trails in our lives. Does anyone know what it's like for the legal system to fail them? Of course. Of course we know what it's like for the legal system to fail us. Does anyone know what it's like to scream out in pain, in anguish, but you would say, I did not sign up for this trail that I'm on. Of course you'd have. 
Of course people have. No one signs up for gruesome, difficult, challenging trails in life. We dream of nice homes with white picket fences. Of course, we dream of reaching the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow as we're young and growing up. We want to reach for the stars, go for the moon, and have all we can have as far as life is concerned with comforts and health and security, financial prosperity. Oh, that rings with us. Let's get on that kind of a trail. Let's ride that one out. We'd love to tiptoe through daisies and tulip gardens, but we have not signed up for pain and anguish and discomfort and thorns. And sometimes we just shake our fists, look up and shake our fists. I don't want this trail. During the height of Jesus' ministry, when he was calling disciples, he, Luke chapter 9, 57, he says, as they were walking along the road, a man said, hey, I'll follow you anywhere. Yeah. I'll follow you anywhere. So Jesus kind of said, I, I want to lay down something here. And here's what he said. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I, I don't have any place to lay my head. Are you sure? You want to follow me? There are some uncertainties in this walk, in this journey, in being a disciple. There may be pain, and it could get even worse. Do you still want to follow me? Do you still want to journey with me? Do you still want to walk the trail? In Luke chapter 24, we read of two disciples, the the Bible says they were on their way to the road, to Emmaus. I think it was 12 miles or kilometers from Jerusalem. It was Easter Sunday morning. They didn't know that Jesus Christ had been resurrected from the grave yet. They were still living in, in, in Black Friday, Dark Friday. And so they're walking this road to Emmaus, talking with each other. They didn't want to be on that road. They didn't want to be on that trail. They didn't want to be discussing their questions about the death of Jesus. They didn't want to be discussing their broken dreams because of the great plans they had for Jesus. We had hoped he was going to do something, shake the place up, but he goes and dies. We're not too excited about this trail that we're on, the tears and the sorrow and the heartbreak. We don't want to be on this path. Job said in chapter 30, verse 13, they break up my road. And that's just kind of the way it is at times in our life. Our road just gets broken up, filled with potholes like a springtime road in Brandon. The potholes, the bumps, bang! New shocks are needed in your vehicle. Sometimes our road just gets broken up, the trail that we're on. Proverbs 26, verse 13 says, the sluggard says, there's a lion on the road, a fierce lion roaming on the streets. You know what the rest of the scripture says? As the door turns on its hinges, so he turns on his bed. How many know that swinging doors go nowhere? They don't go anywhere. Neither does tossing and turning in bed get you anywhere. There always be fierce and growling lions on the trail. Staying in bed won't help. Who are you going to call? What are you going to do? Oh, it's in here. I might as well say it. Who are you going to call? Don't call Ghostbusters. <laughs> well, that's just the Holy Ghost Buster. Put the Holy in there. Who are you going to call? The Holy Ghost Buster. <laughs> I like that myself, actually. <laughs> wow. I really... I think I like that one. Let's go to Hebrews. Who are you going to call? Now it's going to follow me all the way through, believe me. It'll follow. It'll just be a thread I'll throw in at some point in time when you're just drifting off. Who are you going to call? Holy Ghost Busters. Let's make a bumper stick. Let's leave it alone. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Fixing. 
So who, what are you going to do? Okay, that was where we were going with that, weren't we? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Consider him. Who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him. The Lord Jesus Christ, the, that is the one. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, it tells us that we're encouraged to fix our thoughts on Jesus, but this particular scripture passage I read is encouraging us to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Just think for a moment. If you could keep your thoughts on Jesus, and if you could keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus, how would your life be transformed and changed? Fix does not mean take a glance. Fix does not mean take a peek or take a half look or carelessly view. Fix means to fasten. Fix means to rivet your mind, vis rivet your eyes upon him. Fix means to pay attention, to be fixated, to set your eyes, to, for them to be immovable, for your eyes to be glued upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you will fix your thoughts on Jesus, if you'll fix your eyes upon Jesus, every other part of you will have no choice but to follow. Try it, and you'll find out that it is absolutely true. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, fix your eyes upon Jesus, and everything else will have to follow. Your walk will follow, your talk will follow, your countenance will follow, your perspective will follow, your hope will follow, your actions will follow, your direction will follow. Travel the sunrise trail with Jesus, it will lead you to the resurrection. It will lead you to Easter Sunday. Follow the trail. Follow the trail. Doesn't matter how hard it may get, how rough it might get. Follow the trail. Follow the trail. It'll get you to Easter Sunday, your own personal Easter Sunday and resurrection. Let me share this with you. Oh, I found that 60 reasons, 60 reasons why Jesus is everything to me. He is my peace. I'm going for 60. <laughs> he is my peace. He is my joy. He is the atonement for my sins. He is my sanctifier. He is my shepherd. He is my song of praise. He is my income. He is my insurance. He is my future. He is my only Lord and, and ruler. He is my fortress. He is my master. He is my captain. He is my rest. He is my storeroom. He is my physician. He is my goal. He is my forerunner. He's my comfort. He is my judge. He is my fortune and my prosperity. He is my wisdom and my understanding. He is the word. He is my faithful, upright friend. He is my interest. He is my rock. He is my life. He is the truth. He is my defender. He is the mediator. He is my true brother. He is my comfort. He is the tree of life. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the head of the church. He is my strength. He is God's power. He is God's wisdom. He is the mystery of God. He is the giver of all good gifts. He is my refuge. He is the fountain of life. That's probably 25. I just highlighted some of my favorites. All back by Scripture. That is who the Lord Jesus Christ is to me. And you. And to all the saints. And to all the brothers. All the ones that put their faith in Jesus. You don't walk this trail alone. Who are you going to call? Jesus. Who are you going to call? The Holy Ghost. He will bust those situations. If he doesn't bust them, he'll get you through them. He'll bust you through them. Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all of your needs. According to his riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Romans 8 and 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Focus on your problems and you'll shrivel up and you will die. 
If you focus on Jesus being your everything and travel with him on the sunrise trail, you will go through your pain and to your own Easter Sunday. Oh, the disciples, they gave up, didn't they? Disciples gave up in the garden. Exhausted, they fell asleep. Luke 22, 39. Later they gave up and they scattered when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. What does, what does Jesus call us to do? Carry on. Continue on the sunrise trail. Don't drift off. Don't scatter. Don't run. Pilate, he gave up because of the pressure. and Gave in to the demands of an angry mob. Gave in to that crowd of people. He gave in to the demands of injustice. What does Jesus call us to do? Carry on. Continue on the sunrise trail. Don't cave in to the pressure. Don't cave in to the crowds. Judas gave in to the temptation of greed. Greed. Later, he gave up completely and in desperation took his own life. What does Jesus tell us to do and call us to do? Carry on the sunrise trail. Yield not to temptation. Taking your life is not the answer. Suicide is not the answer. Suicide comes from the enemy. Thoughts, bad thoughts, evil thoughts. Suicide is not the way out. Carry on the sunrise trail. Yes, it might get rough, but carry on the sunrise trail and you'll get to Easter Sunday. Amen, Gary. That's good. Peter, he gave up under pressure from the courtyard, didn't he? He denied even knowing his Lord. What does Jesus call us to do? Again, continue on the sunrise trail. Don't buckle. Follow Jesus. Don't follow the wayward crowd. Follow the trail. Follow the sun on the trail, the S-O-N on the trail. Who are you going to call? Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The one who never gave up. Never. But the one who carried on and continually, steadfastly walked the sun, S-O-N, rise trail. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross with the mockings, all that stuff. The joy set before him was Easter Sunday, was the resurrection. The pain was Good Friday, but the joy set before him was three days later. The joy that was set before him was you and I, the world. That was his joy. He focused on the joy. That was what was set before him. He endured the trials. He endured the beatings. He endured the flying fists. He endured the insults. He endured the mocking. He endured the spitting. He endured the nakedness. He endured the worst man could throw at him. He endured death for you. For you, for me. Oh, how we never should take salvation for granted. Oh. To think of what Jesus Christ did so that I could stand here this morning and preach the good news of the gospel. To think that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was resurrected, that we could go to the fair with hope and with a ray of sunshine, and a word, Jesus. He died for the world. He died for the world. Think of that when you go through your bumps, potholes on the sunrise trail. Jesus died for me. His trail was terrible. It was brutal. One Corinthians 
15, 57, and 58 says, but thanks be to God that he gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he, he's encouraging us. Keep on the trail. Thanks be to God. We, have, we get the victory. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says stand firm. Let nothing move you. Let nothing shake you off the trail. Let nothing disturb you and disrupt you and destroy you and tear you apart. Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. You might be here this morning. You might say, oh, that's so easy for you to say. You haven't walked in my shoes. That's what you might be thinking. That is so easy for you. Is it really? Have you walked in my shoes? Have you fought any of the battles I have fought? Have you felt any of the pain that I have felt? You don't know. Have you seen the tears that have streamed down my face? No, you haven't. I want you to know that being a pastor does not isolate you from the headwinds in life. Being a pastor does not shelter you from the pain. It doesn't. I don't know what you've gone through. You don't know what I have gone through. Let me tell you what I've learned. Through the pain, through the battles, through the tears, through the struggles, I have learned to stay on the sunrise trail. That's what I have learned. It always leads to Easter Sunday and victory. It will always lead to the hands raised and giving glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, that you got me through. If you stay on the sunrise trail, you will get to your own Easter Sunday. Amen. That's what I've learned. Stay on the sunrise trail. It may be Friday, but Tony Campolo said, it may be Friday, but Sunday is a coming. And as you're walking difficult trails, just say that. It may be Friday. It may be a Friday trail I'm walking, but Sunday's a coming. Sunday's a coming. Sunday's a coming. There's going to be resurrection. There's going to be celebration. There's going to be Easter Sunday for me. I'm going to raise my hands in total victory because Jesus gets me through. Who are you going to call? Jesus Christ. The master of the storms, the deliverer. Now, let me go on to share with you a key. A key. If you want to make it through on this trail, it might be rough for you right now this morning. Jesus has a standing invitation to us. Along the sunrise trail, call on me, and I will answer you. Jeremiah 33, and verse 3. Call upon me, and I will answer. Calling upon Jesus Christ is the greatest privilege you and I will ever, ever have, that we can call upon him. His ears are open to the cries of the righteous, the Bible says. The prayers of the saints capture his attention. The prayers of the saints Move him to action. The prayers of the saints please him. That's what he's always wanted throughout the entire Bible from Genesis right to the end. He's always wanted people to what? Turn to him. Remember him. Call upon him. Worship him. Adore him. He's always wanted that. I'm so challenged by Martin Luther who said, I've got so much to do today that I must spend the first three hours in prayer. Oh, that moves me. I'm so challenged by the Apostle James, who is nicknamed Old Camel Knees, because according to tradition, he spent so much time on his knees praying that his knees resembled the calloused knees of a camel. I'm so challenged by a message I heard 
Probably back in 1979 in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, there was a group coming through called the Prayer Wheels, a singing gospel group from New York. And I will never forget the title of his message. The title of his message was this, Are Your Knees Dirty? You know what that means? Are your knees dirty? He spoke about prayer. He spoke about calling upon the Lord. I'm so challenged by these examples, and these examples are not to lay guilt upon me, not to lay guilt upon you, and to measure, to show us how we don't measure up, but these are great examples for me and for you as well to encourage us to get alone and spend some time in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's meant to do, to challenge me to spend time with Jesus. Speaking to my personal Savior, I can pray on my feet. I can pray as I walk. I can pray as I drive. I can pray no matter where I'm at or what I'm doing. Yes, prayer needs to be my lifestyle along the sunrise trail, and there needs to be a constant consciousness of engaging with Jesus because we know that brings spiritual growth and maturity in my relationship with Jesus. But here is the key. I also believe as we travel along the sunrise trail, there will be those Gethsemane moments, Gethsemane moments where we desperately need to pull over, pull in, pull away from it all and get down upon our knees and get down upon our face. As someone said one time, and just eat the carpet. Get your face on the carpet. Ever been there? Ever been there flat out on your face before God? That's those Gethsemane moments that God is calling us to, to pull away and get away from the mess. Get down upon your knees. Find your Gethsemane. Find your garden. Find your place. Get away from the crowds. Get away from the chaos. Get away from the nightmare. And just get in your Gethsemane. Get in your moments. Get in that place. And call upon the name of Jesus. And why do we need those? Because when we're in a tornado. And the road is a mess. And we are a mess. And life is a mess. That is the place to be. In the garden of Gethsemane. That's the key, one of the keys. Well, Jesus traveled that sunrise trail to Easter Sunday. You'll note in the Bible and Scripture that he pulled himself away from the chaos as he spoke with his heavenly Father. It was good timing. It was a good time to be well disciplined because it was rough in Jesus' life. And I want you to know what happened in the Gethsemane garden. Here's what happened. Jesus poured himself out. And you can do the very same in your Gethsemane spot, wherever it might be. You just pour your heart completely out. You cry a river. You just let it out. Jesus did. Second thing we read in Scripture is that Jesus received strength, might, and power from God Almighty in the garden. That's where you get your strength and your power. That is where you're able to get back up on your feet and walk the trail and go to work and parent and raise children and go to the job and make a living and continue on in ministry and do what God has called you to do. That is where my friends, you get the strength and the power and the might, the Holy Spirit will come upon you 
and enable you to keep on the sunrise trail. It was in the garden that Jesus fought off the temptation to throw in the tra- towel. What if he would have? Where would we be? Fought out of temptation to throw in the towel and avoid the cross, run the other way. He fought off that temptation in the garden, the quiet place. It was in the garden of Gethsemane that Jesus embraced the difficult will of the Father. The will of God is not always easy for you and I. It's just not. Anyone who says the will of God will always be pleasant and wonderful, and, and they don't know. The will of God is not always easy. The will of God sometimes is not pretty. It's difficult. It's challenging. But it was in the garden that Jesus said, it's not my will, but your will is going to be done. I will follow the will of the Father. That took place in the garden. That's what can take place in your garden. As you call upon the Lord, you will settle the matter with him. If it's your will, I'll follow it. If it's you that wants me to go on this path, I will continue. I will do it. All took place in the garden. It was in the garden of Gethsemane that Jesus humbled himself to a greater cause which was the salvation of the world, humbled himself. Again, not your will, but my will be, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Humbled himself. It's not about me. That's what Jesus was saying. It's not about me. One of the greatest lessons we could ever learn is it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about you humbling yourself to the Lord and letting him lead you on the trail that he's called you to lead. Those are things you learn in Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, it's key. If you want to make it to Easter Sunday, an Easter Sunday celebration in your life, you've got to find those moments. Find that place, your own Gethsemane, and just let God work on you. And let him pour himself out into you. As you pour yourself out to him, he'll replenish. He will equip. He will empower. And you'll get up and you'll look back. And on Easter Sunday, whenever that Easter Sunday might come for you, you end up just celebrating and say, oh, my Lord, I'm so glad that over here I was tempted to throw the towel in. I was tempted to run. I was tempted to just get Far away from it, but I kept on the trail. I kept on the trail. I kept walking. It was difficult. But here I am today. I'm standing. It's Easter Sunday for me. It's a time of celebration. I've got my hands raised in victory. Jesus Christ has got me through it. And you celebrate. There'll be more. There'll be more trails before you die. There'll be more Easter Sundays. Stay on the sunrise trail. Stand with me. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber or sleep. As you sleep at night, he's watching over you. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep 
you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of God for you and for me. Stay on the sunrise trail. It'll lead you to the celebration of Easter Sunday. Let's sing a song, and as we sing it, if you're here this morning and you say, oh, I just need someone to agree with me in prayer, I got some difficulties, challenges, we'll pray for you. Just come to the front and stand here. That way you'll identify yourself as someone who would like prayer. As the team lead us in song, feel free to step out and come forward. Then we'll close in prayer in a moment.